Well, welcome everybody. That worked out way better <laughs> than it probably should have, but uh, but here we are. So I really, really appreciate you guys all being here. Um, what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, is just do a quick introduction to everybody um, and then jump into the questions. I know we've got limited time and I wanna make sure that I give each of you an opportunity to answer some questions. And then of course, at the very end, uh, Teresa will be monitoring the questions uh, in chat room. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be some additional questions there. And, uh, and again, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, so everybody, uh, if you will look, if you have questions, if you have any comments, please do so in the chat box. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, we've got five great uh, mortgage professionals that are going to be answering a series of questions that we've got we've gathered from, from some of you all in advance. Um, the first one is Brenda Hughes. Uh, Brenda is the Senior Vice President and Director of Mortgage and Retail Lending for First Federal Savings Bank in Twin Falls. Um, she's been active in the industry since 1987. Uh, she's currently in charge of oversight of all aspects of the mortgage consumer origination processing, underwriting, and loan servicing. Um, we also have Shannon Foley, who is the branch manager of Cornerstone Home Lending in Bozeman, Montana. She's been in the industry for over 14 years. From Illinois, uh, graduated from Montana State University. Go Cats, and uh, she's a rookie of the year, like all of the things that you would expect out of a rock star, so welcome. Uh, we also have Lindy, Lindsay Zondag, who's the uh, mortgage loan officer with Movement Mortgage in Ketchum, Idaho. Obviously, she serves uh, outside the Wood River Valley as well. We've got Darren Wade with uh, uh, Fairway Independent Mortgage. Um, he is here in Grand Junction, Colorado, serves Mesa County and beyond. Been in the industry for more than 20 years. He's the area manager here. And then we've got uh, Bonnie, and I, I hope I say this correctly. Is it Marletti? Just Marlette. 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 Oh, I was so close. <laughs> Branch manager for Security National Mortgage in Vail, Colorado. She's been in the business for over 18 years. Uh, I, and, and Bonnie, obviously, being in a resort market, much like Lindsay, uh, it, great for the conforming product, but also understands the jumbo product as well. So we got a great panel today. Are you all ready? Ready? Yeah. Yes. Think so. All right. Beautiful. All right. So I'm just gonna. Um, obviously, we've got 30 minutes, so I'm gonna ask a question, and then I'll just pick you all to to answer that question, so we can sort of stay on track. The first question that I have uh, from from the from the group is that with over 17 million people now. Um, unemployed, what is the impact that, that that's having and what are some of the, some of the relief options that may be available to the, the mortgage holder uh, or, the, or the, the homeowner right now if they're having a challenge paying their bills? And Shannon, why don't we start with you? So as far as relief options go, really the option that is out there for mortgages right now um, is called forbearance. And I think that there's a lot of misconception about what forbearance is out in the market um, and a lot of media, you know, surrounding it saying basically you can just skip your payments. Um, so forbearance is great for people who, you know, need to skip their payments right now, who've lost their jobs and who cannot afford to make their payments. They should be doing this, but it is not just a free skip your payment um, sort of thing. You have to make those payments back up. And so a lot of people aren't understanding that. And I feel like it's really important for us to get that out to our clients, um, to our borrowers, is that forbearance is, is there to serve a purpose, but it's not just there. If you can make your mortgage payment, you should still make your mortgage payment. Um, because, you know, there's some long-term consequences for that as far as you've got to repay it in, in a modification or um, adding to your monthly payment once you are able to make your payments again. So, right. yeah. Thank you. Brenda, uh, can you maybe expand a little bit on, on that? So, so if, if I do go the forbearance route, what does that mean? Like, what do you mean I have to pay it back and, and how do we make adjustments to the mortgage? Absolutely. And Shannon did a great job explaining that at the onset. The agencies, I think it's important for consumers to know that those only apply to agency insured loans. So loans that are serviced or owned by Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, VA, FHA, Rural Development. So if you have a loan that's not owned by any of those individuals or those institutions, 
then you need to reach out, consumers need to reach out to their financial institution to find out what options are available. Many banks are actually doing modifications in lieu of doing the forbearance because as Shannon noted, it's easier to maybe take care of what's that long-term plan at the onset instead of just kicking those payments down the curb and then in 60 days or 90 days after you've foreborn them, having to make those payments all at once or doing a modification at that time. So, so the forbearance then, um, uh, Darren, when we're talking about forbearance, we're talking about a temporary relief, meaning that we're going to have to make up the payments in 30, 60, 120 right. days, whatever that number is, versus the loan modification, meaning that I can, I add that on, like, can you walk us through it? Every servicer is going to be a little bit different. And so Brendan and Shannon, they said this correctly. Every servicer is a little bit different. So no one really knows. Right now they're going to say, we're going to, we're going to put you in forbearance and that you're not, not going to have to make a payment for three months, six months, who knows. But they, that may all come due all at once, depending on what the servicer has to say. Okay. And from a modification standpoint, what are you all seeing on the street? Or are you seeing anything on the street? Uh, and I might throw this to you, Bonnie. Uh, are you seeing any kind of modifications being done or are we just talking about them? Yeah, um, at this time, and, and you guys can chime in too, I'm not seeing anything talked about for modifications. Right now it's all um, servicer driven. So like Darren said, everybody's doing it a little bit differently. The most important thing that people can come away with from this is to call their mortgage servicer tell them they can't make their payment. And then that individual servicer is gonna offer them, they might offer them one month. So right now what I'm hearing and being, what's being talked about, is just maybe a one to three month, but it's one month at a time. I know a lot of people who have called and they're just told, okay, we're gonna defer this one payment. In some cases they're, like Darren suggested, they're saying, okay, in two months, you're gonna owe the entire amount. Well, obviously people that aren't getting a paycheck are not going to have saved up two months of payments. So then at that point, they're saying, we'll call back again, you know, in, in May, in June, call back again. So they're really handling this a month at a time. Um, you know, like Shannon referenced, if you can make your payment, make your payment. If people are getting stimulus checks, those stimulus checks hopefully are going to make your payment um, and all payments alike. If you can't make your car payment, your credit card payment, just call them and they're going to defer the payments, but then um, it's going to either be tacked on or it's going to be due at some point. Um, I'm not, I haven't heard of any modifications at this time, but I'm sure that will come as l further along as we get when people maybe, maybe some people aren't going to be able to go back to work. Then there might be, um, you know, I think we're all hoping this is going to be a 30, 60 day issue and, we can get back to it. Yeah, exactly. Fingers crossed. Right. right. I add the modification. So, sorry, go ahead, Darren. Uh, yeah, uh, so thinking back to the last financial crisis, how easy was it for our customers to get a loan modification? It was Very easy. difficult. No, right. they'd so, have to be late. I'll, I'll, right, I'll just modify my loan down the road. No. I'm still, still thinking, I don't think that's going to, I think if you have any way to make your mortgage payment now, you make it because who knows where, where you're going to be 60 days, 90, 000, 90 days down the road. If the servicer says, hey, we need all three months. And then typically what would happen if you had to go into modification, the investor would say, or the servicer would say, well, just quit making your payments because we can't modify your loan if you're current or if you're not 60, 90 days past due. And then you wreck your credit. And then, if, then when it comes down to it, they won't modify it anyway. That's, yeah. that's the real yeah. issue. Okay. But there, I don't think that's the answer that we're looking for, but hopefully the deferments are going to allow people to stay current. Um, and I know you guys are all agree that uh, credit scores are going to be more and more important. So for people to not be late and just to get their payments deferred so that they're not taking late payments or, you know, late hits on their credit. So, so that, that's a good one. That's actually right in with the next question. And I'll send this one to you, Lindsay. Um, uh, with the job losses and people's inability to make some of their payments, how are you expecting to see this impact credit scores and therefore underwriting and loans in the future? Yeah, well, right now we're tightening up pretty heavily on credit scores. A lot of places have gone to, if you have less than a 700 credit score on a conventional loan, we're just not going to lend at this point. And again, these things are moving so quickly in a week from today, it could be 
back to normal. Um, one of the other things I wanted to point out too with this forbearance or people saying, gosh, I just can't make a payment. If you have a co-signer on your loan, don't forget them. Um, I've had a couple people in the service industry that I financed over the last year or two. We had to get a co-signer, um, you know, a mom or a dad is typically who, who's co-signed it. If they're not working, that needs to be a conversation that you remind them, you know, you've got somebody else's credit on the line here. And since credit scores, like we're talking about, are going to be so important, um, you don't want to screw that up. Um, so that needs to be a conversation. If you've got another co-signer or somebody else hooked to that loan and you can't make a payment, that needs to be your first call. Yeah, oh, that's, that's great. Shannon, um, what, what, are you, what are you seeing on the credit score front and what are you expecting to see in the future from an underwriting perspective? Yeah, I think, you know, we really don't know what the long-term impact of these forbearances can be. Um, when Fannie originally came out with this, they were, we were told, you know, you don't have to report um, per the CARES Act. But since then, on April 8th, they came back out and said, you don't have to report late payments, but you do have to report the status of the loan. And the status of the loan is a code in the credit report that will affect our automated underwriting systems. So we're already being told on our side that you can't do refis or purchases, obviously on loans that are in forbearance refis, um, that likely you, know, you need to be 12 months out of forbearance before we could do a purchase. So the long-term impact of this on our industry could be significant Again, these things are changing. I've been on three phone calls about forbearance in the last seven days. So we're getting tons of new information. Things are changing constantly. But I think that the long-term impact of, you know, how these, how we get approvals, maybe not necessarily the scores themselves, but the approvals with the coding on the credit reports could be really significant. So Brenda, I, I, gotta, I gotta bring you in this because it, 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 it appears that this is something you are uniquely qualified to answer. So using your past wisdom and experience, what's your best guess on what this is going to do to credit scores and underwriting? My, my response is going to maybe be a little bit different. And we are actively, because we do service so many loans, we are actively doing modifications and have already done and processed many of them. So I think that it's, it's important for people to know that modification options are out there. Um, in the credit score space, the agencies are they have changed their mind a couple of times and the way that they've put information out there, but they have been very specific and the CARES Act has been very specific that we cannot report these individuals as late. So if they are shown as a, somebody who's been impacted by COVID, we cannot, and as a servicer, I cannot report these borrowers as late if they have a deferral through the program or forbearance through the program as it's been impacted by COVID, much like they do with the national disasters. So there's a lot of work being done around this to make sure that consumers are protected through this. Um, Shannon is correct that there is information coming out that if you have somebody who's currently in a forbearance that you can't go do a refinance for them and deliver it to the agencies. So there are a lot of moving pieces to this and it's basically drinking from the fire hose right now with all the information that's coming down from the agencies right now. And it's just crazy. So, so given what it is right now, um, if I choose to go into a forbearance or some kind of a modification, my credit is going to show that I am in forbearance, not that I have a late payment. Um, and that's going to impact my ability to do some loan, like do a HELOC or whatever, refi or that kind of deal. Um, Bonnie, when, when you look into your crystal ball for the future, is that something that sort of has to change? I mean, if this is going to be a more prevalent kind of thing, depending on how long this lasts, doesn't the underwriting process need to change so that it's not so heavily weighted against somebody that, that chose to get a modification or a forbearance? Give me the, the tough question, huh, Todd? Um, right. So, um, no, I think, um, taking a step back from that is that we have to remember our industry is sometimes investor driven. So for people that aren't holding these loans on their balance sheet, most of the mortgage industry is bundled and sold on the secondary market. So it's not necessarily going to be coming from an underwriting standpoint of us saying, okay, yes, we understand times are rough. It's going to be, um, are these loans going to be purchased and we're going, we have to underwrite to those standards um, so I think my crystal ball 
unfortunately it might be no. I mean, it's still going to be based on your credit score. And if you, like now, if you have a mortgage late, a lot of times you cannot do a refinance or having a mortgage late really affects you, even a credit card later. So um, it's, it's all risk driven. It's risk driven. So when the investors look at these loans, they're like, what's the probability of these borrowers making their payment? And make the probability of making your payment is, can you make your payment? Did you make your payment? So again, um, for people that are going to get the stimulus checks, use those to pay your bills. Um, and if you can't, you know, times are tough and there's going to be some situations and, you know, get those payments deferred. But I don't, I don't see, I don't know, I'd love to hear from the rest of the panel on that. I think that lending is going to, we've already seen it tighten. Um, investors don't want loans that are going to default. So there's no other way to. Well, it seems like they're sort of hedging currently, given the, the current environment, they're hedging um, obviously in their favor, which they should. So Lindsay, I might pass that along to you as well. Like, What does your crystal ball tell you? I think Bonnie hit the nail on the head. This is an investment. Um, and if we can't sell our loans to somebody, um, we're not going to, to have a market for them. Um, it, it comes down to the numbers. If we have somebody, you know, as Bonnie said, who cannot make their mortgage payment um, for whatever reason, I think that it's kind of a hard and fast line that there's going to be some problems down the road. Um, anybody else have anything uh, that they want to add on on that front from a perspective of you know, I'm going to get dinged now on my credit in the future crystal ball wise like are we expecting things to soften am I going to be able to get a loan if I went through with the forbearance now I would just add that if, as long as consumers are proactively reaching out to their mortgage servicers and they get these forbearances in place and these um, deferrals in place the credit should be protected so this is going to really rely on the consumer being proactive and reaching out and, and asking for the assistance they need. Um, the other thing is that the investors are really being proactive and saying, before you close those loans, if you've got a self-employed borrower, are they still working? Have they been impacted? Um, do your regular non-self-employed borrowers, have they been impacted? Are they still working? So they're requiring from an investor standpoint that we do all that vetting before we deliver those loans to the secondary market. So hopefully there's some self-protection in there from the lenders and from the consumers as well. But a lot of this is gonna be driven on the consumers proactively taking it. That's wonderful. That's awesome. Great advice. Um, hey, a uh, little side note here. Are any of you doing um, commercial real estate lending? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. So Brenda, I'll, I'll go to you here. Just, are you seeing anything happen there? So it's, it's interesting to me, right? There's all this talk about um, the home mortgage and uh, forbearance and modifications and that kind of thing. And then of course, you've got a lot of the, the tenant driven issues being closed down. Not, not being able to earn revenue, therefore not being able to afford their rent, which obviously has a direct impact on the investor being able to make their mortgage payments. What are you seeing on that side? On the commercial side, we're actually seeing a slowdown from a request coming in, not necessarily from the bank's desire to actually do those loans and underwrite them appropriately and still commit to to those loan proceeds, but more of the consumer being cautious about what's gonna happen in the market and maybe not moving forward with some transactions that were pending and basically taking a step back. Beautiful, thank you for that. Um, all right, so next question I have is, what can buyers do that, that are like active buyers in today's market to make sure that they get ahead of the game? Um, there's lots of talk about um, obviously credit scores and underwriting being so much more and um, uh, appraisals taking longer, like all of these, these different things. Lindsay, what can a buyer that's active in the market right now do to make sure that they're ahead of the game? Yeah, um, a pre-approval is always a great idea. Um, I've got a couple of folks right now that are, are not maybe actively searching, but they're going to be searching probably later this spring. We get them underwritten, we go through their tax returns, we ensure that um, they've got you know their 20% down or however much they're gonna put down. If they're interested in a certain condo project, which we have a, a lot of condos in Sun Valley, we make sure that the condo project is financeable. 
um, we just vet the, um, the borrower pretty thoroughly. And that way, when we're ready to move, really the appraisal is kind of the last big hurdle that we need to get through. Um, and then we kind of also let borrowers know what rates are, you know, what's your monthly payment going to look like? Um, just so everybody's on board with, uh, with the numbers um, and try to expedite as much as we can. Because the reality is that somebody that, that was pretty confident that they had all of their ducks in a row a month ago might not have all their ducks in a row today, yes? Exactly, yeah, okay. yeah. And we, the borrowers so, that I am seeing um, that want to get pre-approved or that are looking are really strong borrowers. Um, most of them understand that, um, you know, real estate goes up and down. They want to buy a condo in Sun Valley, Idaho or a home in Haley. Um, they're going to buy it. Um, I have not had a huge downturn in uh, um, purchase contracts. That's actually held pretty stead steady throughout the spring. And this is kind of when we start to see um, purchases come back. And surprisingly, and very pleasantly, we've had quite a few of them the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And which, which is really saying something, especially considering the markets that are represented on this call here, Sun Valley from a per capita standpoint is one of the hardest hit from a COVID perspective of any place in the country. So that's, that's pretty amazing. So Bonnie, a uh, question to you. So kind of the, along the same, same lines, are you seeing, uh, like if I'm, if I'm a, a conforming, like a conventional type uh, borrower versus the jumbo world that you live in, um, is, there, is there a difference right now? So I, as a buyer, is there something special I should be doing if I'm a jumbo buyer or, or is that even av available in today's market? Um, we have seen um, some of what we call non-QM, so the qualified mortgages, anything non-QM buckets, some of those investors are going away. Um, much like we saw in 2008 with the, with, the, with the housing crisis, a lot of lenders that were doing out-of-the-box financing are not going to be in the game anymore. We're going to see some of that fall out. Um, I actually do a lot of conforming here in Eagle County, um, conforming in government loans. And I, like Lindsay, am, am seeing the usual, maybe a little bit slower or stalled, like, like the agents are seeing the market stalling a little bit, but I'm still getting pre-qualification requests. And I would say a healthy amount of folks that still want to buy, they're waiting till the, you know, the lift is, so that they can go and view a homes or they're viewing homes virtually. And um, same thing, you definitely want to make sure that that they're pre-qualified. They may not want to tell their agent that they're furloughed. It, it's not something that people like to say. And you might not want to ask them. I will ask them um, or your lender, whoever you're, you're working with. So you definitely want to make sure that they're talking to a lender just to make sure. And I have some too that we're, we're actively shopping and now they're furloughed, that's okay. I know those clients are going to go back as soon as their employees, employers open. And so it's just a matter of timing it and being ready. You know, I think a lot of people are anticipating it's going to be really busy when the, when it, you know, there's going to be a flood maybe of new inventory and that, that's been held back that comes up. And so more than ever, you want to have your buyers that are ready to go. They find the property, they're the first ones that can put in an offer and they've already got all their ducks in a row. Um, more, we'll see what happens, but people stuck at home, if they don't like where they live, they're going to be really wanting to find a house that they want to be in because we're right. spending a lot of time at home. True. Yeah, no so kidding. we might, you know, that dream of home ownership might be more than ever. People want to live in the home that they own. So we'll see. Maybe this will, you know, the people that are um, taking initiative to make sure that their credit is not going to be hurt by this, um, then as soon as they can get back to work, everything's going to hopefully roll forward. I love that. So Shannon, um, uh, so we're, hear we're hearing a lot of talk about shadow inventory. Uh, Bonnie just mentioned something that I, I love, right? So not only do we have quote unquote shadow inventory of people who maybe aren't bringing their properties to market, so there's going to be all this new inventory available, but, but, it, but Bonnie was alluding to this idea of maybe a shadow inventory of buyers who are kind of getting their ducks in a row, getting pre-qualified mm -hmm. and waiting for all of that inventory to hit so that they can then enter the market, but they're not technically entering the market now. Um, what are you seeing in, in Bozeman and surrounding areas? 
You know, our purchase business, I mean, as far as pre-approvals going into the spring is really still on par with where I would expect it to be, maybe even a little bit more. Um, so it's been really good. And I feel like I have a lot of people who had been kind of sitting last year and him hawing around that all of a sudden are coming out of the woodwork. Um, so probably because they're sitting in their houses thinking, gosh, why didn't I do this last fall? Um, but anyhow, I, I feel like we are really still seeing a pretty strong purchase market. People have more time on their hands right now. They have time to get you all the documents. Um, they have time to fill out the loan application. So I think that people who had been kind of putting it off because they were too busy or other things now are taking the time to do it. So we've, we've still been seeing a pretty consistent amount of prequals, um, purchase prequals coming, coming through the door and rates are still great. So I think it's still a good motivating factor for people to purchase now. Darren, what are you seeing in, uh, in the Mesa County area? Similar, we're seeing a uh, purchase might have slowed a little bit, but um, overall, I think customers really want to get out and if they're able to buy, they want to buy. And uh, we're not seeing that slow down at all. And we're just telling the co consumers we're dealing with, make sure you're staying in touch with the real estate agent and with your lender for any changes that are coming up because the employment is the big thing. You got to stay employed throughout the process. Keep us informed, but we're seeing a lot of activity. We really like it. Um, not down nearly as much as I thought we might be when you see that over the last four weeks, 21 million of people have registered for unemployment, basically. So overall, the market is is not doing nearly nearly as badly as I thought it would. And and I'm really, really, you know, I'm kind of encouraged by that. And, and Brenda, how, how about you down in the valley there? Yeah, we have not really seen a slowdown in purchase activity, and we've definitely not seen a slowdown in construction activity. Both of those have still been really strong for us. Um, obviously, I think everybody on the call is, um, has an influx of refinances because my, the rates definitely dipped lower than anybody anticipated the first quarter, but um, our purchase activity and our construction activity has remained strong throughout all this. So, so Brenda, um, I, I love this next one to you. This, just, just quickly, if I'm a seller, is, is there anything that, like, that I should be making sure that I'm asking for from a buyer that maybe it wasn't as standard of an ask uh, before, or is it still just the typical pre-qualification? I think, you know, it's still the typical pre-qualification with maybe the additional question of, are you impacted by COVID at all from an employment standpoint? Is that going to make it a difference for the bank when you go to finance this? Um, unless you have buyers that are out there ready to pay cash, which there's not a lot of them. Um, so just making sure that that piece is covered, that the employment piece is covered, and then also being aware of what the appraisal constraints may be right now. And if the product that can, the borrower needs to um, finance, if it's going to require an internal appraisal. Some investors are still requiring some internal appraisals and some are allowing drive-bys or exterior only. So just making sure you're, you understand what loan product your buyer is going for and what those parameters are if you don't want those appraisers in there. Darren, what, what, what do you got for us? If I'm, if I'm a seller, is there anything special I need to be asking for right now? Basically, you want to make sure you're the, um, the agent that's representing you has, um, that the buyer is solid. Um, make sure those pre-approvals are spot on, and that's the biggest thing. And just, um, that's the biggest concern, I think, at this point, making sure that there's going to be plenty of time for the dates, the, the appraisal to get out there, uh, the, um, the appraisal will be done. And other than that, I think the process is moving pretty quickly. So, mm -hmm. so, so, uh, Lindsay, I, I know in, in the states that we serve, there, there is this addendum that's out there that, that uh, lots of buyers are trying to put as part of, well, probably both, right? Both buyers or sellers that, that gives some flexibility with dates and the ability to delay and that kind of stuff. Is that having any kind of an impact on the lending process that we should be aware of? As long as we're in communication with both agents on a closed date and when we can release financial contingency, um, everybody seems to be pretty aware that, that things are moving around and everyone's a little more gentle with, uh, with dates than they used to be. Um, okay. One thing that I, I would maybe caution agents um, is down payment funds. We have a lot of folks here that were planning on either selling a property in California to buy a home here, and those funds were going to be their down payment. Um, the house in California fell through, so the house here falls through. So just if there's a, a contingency on there, um, keep an eye on that. Um, that's something to kind of watch for. 
Um, and a lot of folks were using funds from their brokerage accounts for down payment funds. All of a sudden, everybody's brokerage accounts took a pretty big hit and they don't want to pull money out. Um, those are just things to be aware of that I've run into a couple of, a couple of They're almost back, baby. They're almost back. We were looking right. at the S&P 500. We were looking at the numbers from, from, it's actually higher today than it was back on March 13th. So it's, yeah. it's there. And, and Todd, another number that I wanted to point out, I've lost one deal because somebody got laid off. Um, you know, so that's a pretty, you know, everyone is sort of doom and gloom when you hear the, the statistics. Right. Had one deal. Um, yeah. and, and again, I think that's really saying something because of all, of all the markets, right? You're in the market that's most heavily hit by COVID. Like I know we, the, the resort markets especially have been impacted from a closure perspective, uh, but you know, like Telluride and Sun Valley are on par with the lights were turned out. So for you to say that you only had one deal canceled, that really means something. Thanks it for does. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so Shannon, um, anything to add to that? No, I mean, I kind of just will piggyback on what everybody else said. I think that those are all um, really great points. Just looking at the dates on pre-approval letters, making sure that they're recent, right? Um, yeah. And it's always good to know if the lender is verified, verified in writing as far as like income assets, that kind of stuff, how far they are in the process, if you can push enough to get that those questions. Because if people come earlier in the process, like Lindsay was saying, we can do a full underwrite before they even make an offer on a house and that can make their offer a lot stronger. So um, those things are just good things to look at. I think it's pretty much status quo, but just kind of being a little more cautious. That's wonderful. Um, so I got a couple of questions here before we wrap. Uh, looks like Bobby's asking, what about construction loans? What are you seeing there? And I think Brenda, you were the one that was talking about construction loans, weren't you? Yes, and we have not seen a slowdown on those, and, and that's for the entry-level buyer or even up to the jumbo space. We have still been active in that market and have not seen a slowdown. And anybody seen anything different? Uh -uh. Okay. We, we've seen a slowdown in Blaine County on the, um, on the uh, construction, and that's because construction is uh, right. not essential. Halted. So yeah. no one's building, literally no one's building. Um, so that's been uh, kind of quiet on that front. So Amelia is asking, how will the lapse in employment affect people's ability to get approved for mortgages in the future? So, so it's that, it's that furlough, and I'll use that word. This is not a layoff. This is this is specifically a furlough, even if it's for a two or three week period of time, while the employer was waiting for their PPP loans. What's the impact going to have on uh, that client's ability to get a loan in the future? And I'll, and I'll throw I'll, throw that one out. Who wants to answer that one? I'll I'll answer that because I've I've got a lot that are impacted by that right now. Um, I think this is where we're going to see a little leniency in underwriting, where um, normally we're going to average pay stubs. So if we take a year to date amount and we average that, it's going to be down because they had three weeks out of work. That will not be the case, at least in my company. We would take that out of the average so that if they're working. Um, you know, at an hourly rate based on a certain amount of hours and we can show that they, that they work a full 80 hour week or 40 hour work week, um, we're going to be able to use, I think that that gap is not going to negatively impact them is what I'm seeing in my underwriting, which is, which is really positive. I have actually one refinance that they signed and in the three day rescission period to fund um, we found out she had been furloughed from that time from application and funding. And so um, we just held funding. We were supposed to fund on Tuesday. We're just holding it. She actually got back. Her employer got the PPP loan. She's coming back to work today. And then we can just verbally verify she's back and we can fund it. So oh, that's awesome. You know, that's really great. Yeah. We didn't have to start over or say, oh, she's back. It's just, oh, you're back. Okay, let's fund. Wonderful. Um, all right. So, so uh, Darren, I might throw this one at you. Uh, has the commercial FHA turnaround times improved or are they still 12 months to fund? I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, I'm not sure I do either. So if anybody understands that question, otherwise, Robin, if you uh, might clarify just a little bit, that would be fantastic. Uh, I got Bobby asking um, for one of you that is 
uh, doing lots of veteran and medical personnel officer loans, are they still giving special consideration to veterans, medical persons, and law officers? I don't think any of those programs have changed. Those programs that I have seen have not had any restriction from the agencies or the insuring inv investors. Okay. So I, um, I'll, I'll wait for uh, a couple of clarifications. Um, I know that there's gonna be some folks that are gonna want some additional help, questions, support. Uh, can we go through just real quickly, Shannon, why don't we start with you? Again, where where can they reach you? If, if, if I've got a question for something and I'm in the, Montana area. How do I get a hold of you? Well, I'm at home, so you got to call me on my cell phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's 406-581-2958, uh, and you can email me at sfoley, F-O-L-E-Y, at houseloan.com. Beautiful. Bonnie, if I'm in uh, Edwards, or Edwards, Eagle Valley, yeah. uh, how do I get a hold of you? Again, my cell phone, 970-331-2919. Um, and I think I take text, email, phone calls. Um, usually if you're looking for a quick response, text or email is best. Um, but certainly I'm willing to chat and, and um, email bonnie.marlet at snmc.com. Beautiful. Lindsay, if I'm in the Wood River Valley, a beautiful Idaho. Yeah. How do I get a hold of you? Yeah, uh, cell phone uh, at the kitchen table, um, 2 <laughs> 3541 um, And I would be thrilled to speak to somebody I'm not related to. So feel free to call me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Darren, if I'm in Mesa County, how do I get a hold of you, bud? Yeah, my cell phone is call me, text me 970 201 0660. Or you can email, email me at uh, dwade at fairwaymc.com. And Brenda, if I'm in Twin Falls or surrounding area, how do I get a hold of you? Um, phone is 208-736-4440. And email is bhughes at bankfirstfed.com. Beautiful. All right, you guys. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I know that this was hugely valuable for the agents, and I'm sure we had some consumers on the call as well uh, that were looking for some answers. Uh, so expect some phone calls. Again, we so appreciate your support. Uh, and y'all, make sure you give these folks a call. Send them some business. Thanks, Todd. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, Bye, Todd. See you guys. See ya. Bye. Bye.